Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started, and uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you today, and thank you for joining us. I want to introduce uh, first Carrie Allman. Carrie is our internet strategist at the Office of the Bishop, and he is on all of these webinars. He's our IT person, keeps us all on track, teaches us what to do. Most of the time we do it, but not always. And then he's there to remind us what we should be doing. We're always thankful for him. And then uh, our true panelist today is going to lead us, our archivist from the Office of the Bishop in the Diocese of Olympia, Diane Wells. And uh, I just want to say uh, I encouraged her to do this uh, webinar. Uh, she's also planning one that will be a tour of D House. Maybe she'll talk about that a little bit, maybe not. But at some point, we're going to do that. It'll be a virtual tour, which uh, I'm looking forward to that, too. Uh, I have to be honest. I when I became the bishop, I didn't really know how I would use the archives. Uh, Diane has helped me a lot with that. And I can just tell you now, I've, I am so thankful we have them. So thankful we have her. And I use it a lot uh, for history uh, and for context. And it's an amazing asset that we have. And she's been the steward of it. Uh, for so long and for and so well and uh, so I wanted her to be able to share this so uh, I'm gonna say a prayer for us to open up and then I'm gonna turn it over to Diane the Lord be with you and also with you loving God your desire is for our wholeness and well-being we hold in tenderness and prayer the collective suffering of our world at this time we grieve precious lives lost and vulnerable lives threatened. We ache for ourselves and for our neighbors standing before an uncertain future. We pray that love, not fear, would go viral. Inspire our leaders to discern and choose wisely align with the common good. Help us to practice social distancing and mask and every way we can love the other and ourselves and reveal to us new and creative ways to come together in spirit and in solidarity. Call us to a profound trust in your faithful presence, you the God who never will abandon us and loves us always. Amen. So thank you for being here and uh, I will turn it over now to your archivist, Diane mm -hmm. Wells. Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome to the first archives webinar entitled Keeping Archives, Keeping Faith. I want to thank you for joining me this morning. I'd also like to thank Bishop Rickle and Carrie Allman, who will be with us today as I take you on a virtual tour of the diocesan archives. I wish it could be an actual tour, but because of the challenging times that we're living through right now, this uh, virtual version will have to do. As we tour the archives, I'll also be talking a little about how the archives relates to our diocesan vision. The diocesan vision statement reads, in union with our bishop, the Episcopal Diocese of Olympia, part of the Jesus movement, bears witness to God's redemptive reign and acts out God's inclusive love, peace, and justice, uniquely living out this call within our specific local communities. We are locally centered. We believe in network communities. We are committed to forming leaders and we believe in sacrament and service. The archive supports this vision and provides a documentary foundation along with documentary tools to help carry it forward. The archives preserves the record of our efforts and bears witness to our acts when we no longer can. I'll be referring to our vision as we progress through our tour, making connections and underlining the role the archives plays in our shared life as the Diocese of the Episcopal Church. Okay, let's get started. First, what are archives and why do we keep them? How do archives help us keep the faith? How do they help us live into our vision? An archive or archives is both a place where original records of permanent and enduring value are stored, and it's also the records themselves. As Bishop Cochran said, when the diocesan archives was founded, 
1976. We are the people of remembrance. We are the people with a story. Archives keep and tell our stories. All through the long history of our Hebrew Christian tradition, we have been the people who have never allowed ourselves to forget those events of our history in which God has acted to reveal himself to us and make known his loving purpose for us. Bishop Cochran. Archives increase our sense of identity and help us understand who we are and how we came to be. If I may, I'd like to quote from a book entitled Archives Power, Memory, Accountability, and Social Justice by Randall C. Jimerson. Jimerson is a professor of history and director of the graduate program in archives and records management at Western Washington University in Bellingham. He writes, archival sources may not be created for the purpose of immortality, but they do convey human experience over time and distance, allowing us to verify accounts of the past, to confirm or disprove memory, and to provide a sense of continuity, both for individuals and for society itself. Let's keep that in mind as we wander through the diocesan archives. To begin our tour, let's look at where the archives are located. The archives can be found on the third floor of Diocesan House, the former Leary Mansion, in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Seattle. If you look in the middle of the picture up towards the top of the tower, you'll see a rather ugly air conditioner poking out of a window. That is the archives office. Diocesan House was originally built for John and Eliza Leary. Construction was completed around 1909. After Mrs. Leary's death in 1935, ownership of the house passed through several hands until it was purchased by the diocese in 1948 to become the office for the bishop and his staff. The house with its intricate wood carvings and ornate tile work is on the National Register of Historic Places and is a venue for architectural tours. As I just mentioned, the archives is on the third floor and is at, a top, at the top of a very steep flight of stairs. A very steep flight of stairs as I know very well. <clears throat> The archives office is the former billiard room in the house. Two attic rooms provide archive storage, and a third room functions as both storage and reading area. If you're interested in learning more about Diocesan House, please tune in to the archives webinar I'll be hosting soon, entitled A House for Us All, Diocesan House, the former Leary Mansion. Also, in normal times, I do real tours of the house. And when we're open again, you're more than welcome to come and visit. <clears throat> so welcome to the archives. Let's go in. Records in the archives relate to the history and development of the Diocese of Olympia and date from 1853 to the present. Records come in all shapes, sizes, and formats. Paper, photos, film, tapes, and increasingly digital formats. That these materials exist, that they have been preserved, make it possible for us to know how the Diocese of Olympia became what it is today. We believe in networked communities that are stronger when they can share stories, resources, challenges, and triumphs. And many of these stories would be unknown if not for the archives where they have been preserved for our benefit. Among the most important materials kept in the archives are sacramental records, our parish registers. When a parish or mission closes, the archives on behalf of the bishop takes custody of their records, including the parish registers. We currently have registers dating from the 1880s. Not only do these registers provide a record of baptisms, confirmations, marriages, burials, and services, but many of them also contain an account of the history of the congregation. And as they relate to our diocesan vision, these registers document the liturgical life of the church. Many of the records in the archives are of a legal or financial character. 
These records are extremely important as they provide evidence of legal and financial transactions and are essential to the continuity of the diocese and to authenticating its rights and obligations, as well as those of its parishes and missions. These materials include petitions for admission as parishes or missions, articles of incorporation and bylaws, property deeds, contracts, and documentation of the various financial funds, such as the diocesan investment funds and other very important records. Administrative records such as meeting minutes are also permanent and archival. Minutes come to our rescue when our memories fail us. I can't remember what I did last week, let alone what happened in a meeting from a month ago. Minutes provide a record of decisions made, actions taken, and who is responsible for those actions. The archives maintains minutes for diocesan council, board of directors, standing committee, and the various diocesan commissions and committees. These were all previously in paper format, but are now primarily in electronic format and are being maintained in our digital archives. And of course, there are the records that are primarily maintained for their historical value such as the journal of the Reverend Dr. John D. McCarty, the first Episcopal missionary to explore the region that would become the Diocese of Olympia. McCarty founded St. Luke's in Vancouver, the oldest congregation in the diocese, and his journal is held in their archives. I think this passage from McCarty's journal tells us so much about what strength and determination and faith it took to establish the church in our region. Let's just read through this. On May 16, 1853, I set out on an extensive tour of exploration and missionary duty into the new territory of Washington, which is separated from Oregon by the Columbia River. I went by steamboat down this river to the mouth of the Cowlitz, up the same against a strong current in an Indian canoe, then on horseback to Stillicum. I officiated at Fort Nisqually, a post of the Hudson Bay Company. The next day I reached Olympia. On the return journey, I reached Portland the 2nd of June after an absence of 14 days, having traveled 325 miles. Of these, 90 was by steamer, 68 by canoe, and 167 on horseback. There are but few Episcopalians in the territory. At Olympia, a missionary would have the small beginning of an Episcopal congregation. There and in places starting up about the sound, he would have a field of labor of great extent and full of promise. John D. McCarty. In our vision, we are committed to forming leaders and to equipping and empowering a community who is learning, growing, and gathering regularly to proclaim the good news. As we lean into this vision, think about Dr. McCarty and the pioneer missionaries who followed. Think about the hardships they endured and overcame in order to lead us to where we are today. Now a little bit about how the archives is organized. Materials are arranged by numbered record group. The scheme is essentially hierarchical with records relating to the Anglican Communion in record group 100. Records relating to TEC, the Episcopal Church, in Record Group 200. Records relating to the governing bodies of the Diocese of Olympia in Record Group 300. And records relating to individual diocesan offices in Record Group 400, and so on. Here are a few items from Record Group 100, the Anglican Communion, featuring the Lambeth Conference. Bishop Paddock, who we'll hear more about later, attended Lambeth in 1888 taking his son and daughter with him. And we have a variety of notes, invitations, and other memorabilia from that trip in the archives. We also have programs and photographs from more recent conferences, including the one in 2008 with Bishops Rickel and Rivera in attendance. Record Group 200, <clears throat> excuse me, refers to the Episcopal Church, TEC. In this slide, you can see some of the materials we have from the 1967 General Convention, which was held in Seattle. The archives holds materials from most of the General Conventions, 
including the general convention journals. On a diocesan level, Group 300 contains the records of our governing bodies. Some of our most valuable and interesting records are in this group. For example, the archives has all the convocation and convention journals from 1853 to the present, along with associated material, including mailings, clippings, pamphlets, and photos. Bishop's papers are also included in this group. From 1853 to 1880, what would become the Diocese of Olympia was part of the missionary territories of Oregon and Washington. In 1880, Washington became a separate mission, missionary territory. And in 1892, the missionary district of Olympia was created. Thomas Fielding Scott was the first missionary bishop of Oregon and Washington, followed by Benjamin Wister Morris. When Washington was separated from Oregon in 1880, Bishop Morris remained in Oregon, while John Adams Paddock became the first missionary bishop of Washington Territory. And in 1892, Paddock became the missionary bishop of the District of Olympia. Bishop Paddock died in 1894 and was succeeded by William Morris Barker, who died in 1901 and was succeeded, succeeded by Frederick William Keeter in 1902. The archives is fortunate to have a small collection of papers from this missionary period. And all the missionary bishops are pictured here. For instance, we have a copy of Bishop Scott's diary in which he writes of his consecration, subsequent departure from his home in Georgia and the voyage from New York to the West Coast via the Isthmus of Panama, which he and his wife crossed by mule before embarking by ship for San Francisco and Portland, where he arrived in April, 1854. Scott's diary tells quite a story, and it's one of my favorites in the archives. Again, like John McCarty's journal, it's a story of pioneer determination and leadership and also of the human spirit. Here's a couple excerpts from the diary. April 21st. This afternoon, we crossed the bar at the mouth of the Columbia River and anchored at Astoria. It is an unspeakable relief indeed from continued seasickness. April 22nd. A beautiful day and a charming sail up the Columbia and Willamette. In the afternoon, we reached Portland, Oregon, and were very kindly received by Reverend John McCarty and other friends of the church. We were very hospitably taken into the family of General E. Hamilton. Thus, by the good hand of our God upon us, we are at length upon our field of future toil and responsibility. Bishop Scott. We also have records from the episcopates of Bishops Morris, Paddock, Barker, and Keeter, including the founding documents for many of our congregations, and a wonderful handwritten diary of Bishop Paddock's recounting a missionary trip he took to Alaska in 1882. And that diary is the memo book you see on the screen here with Bishop Paddock. The Right Reverend Frederick William Keeter became the missionary bishop of the District of Olympia in 1902 and was bishop when the Diocese of Olympia was established in 1910. And many of the papers from his episcopate deal with becoming a diocese. I love that one pamphlet there in the middle that says the missionary district of Olympia, shall it become a diocese? The Diocese of Olympia was established by General Convention in October 1910. Articles of incorporation for the new diocese were signed on January 24, 1911, and the first convention of the Diocese of Olympia was held May 30th and 31st, 1911 at St. Paul's Church in Seattle. This is what Bishop Keeter said at that first diocesan convention. We stand today at a new point of outlook as we meet together in this first convention of the Diocese of Olympia since its admission into union with the General Convention. 
though the convention wears the same general appearance as the convocation of former years, we all realize that we stand at a new beginning of our church life and work, charged with greater privileges and weightier responsibilities, addressed to the first diocesan convention in 1911, Bishop Keeter. At that time, 49 parishes and missions were listed in the journal, along with 34 clergy. Obviously, a number of clergy serve more than one congregation. The number of communicants is listed as 6,205. Missionary Bishop Keeter became the first diocesan bishop when the diocese was established in 1910 and served until his death in 1924. He was followed by Bishop Simeon Arthur Houston, who served from 1925 to 1947. And it is during his episcopate that existing bishops' records begin to truly reflect the work of that office. If anyone might still be wondering about the relevance of archival materials, about the relevance of words and actions from former times, I'd like to share this excerpt from Bishop Houston's 1944 address to diocesan convention as World War II was drawing to a close. The church has survived a great many wars and it will survive this one, but the church has something more than its own survival value to offer to the post-war world. It has always had as its first concern worship of God and as a logical corollary of that, the welfare of the whole of God's humanity and not of any particular race or nation, class or section. The most insidious undermining of this foundation springs from racial prejudice. I am purposely stressing this race question because I am convinced that it is the most threatening question before the American people today. It cannot be lightly regarded by a nation that professes to be aiming at justice for all races and minority groups throughout the world. Bishop Houston, 1944. Here are just a few items of memorabilia from the bishop's office records. Clippings, testimonials of election, consecration programs, various certificates and invitations. Uh, there's a DVD there of uh, a Bishop Bain's semina seminar and also a DVD of Bishop Rivera's consecration. And there are some rocks that Bishop Bain brought back from the Holy Land. In addition to convention and bishops records, record group 300, 300 governance also includes records of our boards, councils, commissions, and committees. Our diocesan council and board of directors, agendas, minutes, and other materials go back to 1921. The photo in the corner is a photo of diocesan council at St. Andrew's house in 1971. The next group of records comprises uh, the records of our diocesan offices and departments. These records offer insight into the inner workings of the diocese and provide background information on many of the programs that we take for granted. For example, the archdeacon's records are particularly rich in parish and mission materials and offer information on how many of our congregations were formed. Within the records of the communications office, you'll find issues of our various newspapers and publications, some of which date from the 19th century. Stewardship records provide information on the many ways our members give of themselves to the church. And the treasurer's records contain detailed accounts on diocesan money matters, with records including handwritten ledgers going back many years. One of my favorite, favorite publications is the one there that says the Diocese of Olympia, a record of what has been done, what is being done, what has to be done. Camp and Conference Center records date back to 1928 with newspaper articles about Camp Scott, our first diocesan summer camp, originally held on the grounds of Annie Wright Seminary. In 1929, the camp name was changed to Camp Houston after Bishop Houston, 
and in 1931 was moved to its current site in Golbar. We also have records about the Camp of the Holy Spirit, which was located on the shores of Spirit Lake at the foot of Mount St. Helens. Located on Forest Service land and originally a parish camp, it was given to the diocese in 1959 and was operated as a diocesan summer camp until 1971. We're fortunate to have photos of this camp for what remained of the camp after its closure was destroyed by the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. This group of records also contains a variety of materials relating to St. Andrew's House and the Bain Cottage on Hood Canal. Acquired in 1953, St. Andrew's House has served the diocese as a retreat center for more than 60 years. The category of specialized ministries covers a lot of ground. Some of these ministries have been supported directly by the diocese and diocesan staff. Others have received funds and or volunteer assistance from elsewhere. Some of these ministries are current and thriving. Others may have changed their names or structure or even ceased to exist. Whatever the case, we are fortunate to have the records in the archives that chronicle the work of our specialized ministries, work which exemplifies our vision of service to others and outreach beyond our church walls. This slide shows just a few of these missions, or uh, these ministries, uh, the Refugee Resettlement Ministry, Campus Ministry, Mission to Seafarers, uh, Kairos Prison Ministry, the Hospital Chaplain, and the Recreation Ministry, which is St. Bernard's Chapel. Next, we have diocesan organizations, such as the Episcopal Church Women, Girls Friendly Society, Diocesan Altar Guild, and the Volunteer Hostess Corps. Of these four groups, only the Diocesan Altar Guild is currently active. The Volunteer Hostess Corps, whose handbook you see here, is one of my favorites. This group of ladies served at Diocesan House, preparing meals, performing housekeeping tasks, and generally making people feel welcome. There are many other organizations. These are just four examples. Affiliated ministries and institutions are affiliated with the diocese, but are separately incorporated. In many cases, these institutions began as diocesan institutions and later became separate entities, as was the case with Annie Wright Seminary, now Annie Wright School, and Faith Homes, which is actually now closed. There were also five hospitals in the diocese, including the Fanny Paddock Memorial Hospital in Tacoma, which is now Tacoma General. Others were St. David's in Hoquiam, St. Luke's in Bellingham, St. Elizabeth's in Cedarwelly, and Grace Hospital in Seattle. Materials on every parish and mission in the diocese can be found in the archives. There is correspondence between the diocese and the congregations. There are financial files, property files, including architectural drawings, as well as files of historical materials and memorabilia. As you can see, there is also a large photograph collection. Many church photos will soon be featured in a photo gallery on the archives webpage of the diocesan website. The churches featured here include Trinity Everett, St. Columbus Kent, St. Andrew Seattle, Christ Church Tacoma, All Saints Seattle, which is now closed, St. Martin, St. Francis Rockport, and St. Mark's Cathedral. I might mention here that the diocesan archives also holds most of the cathedral archives. Other congregations pictured here include Christ Church Blaine, St. Luke's Vancouver, and St. Christopher in Westport, which is also closed, but I love the tent. The tent was their first, uh, their first meeting place in Westport. Our vision states that we are locally centered, believing that each congregation must be free to live out this vision in a way that best meets their unique needs. These parish and mission files document the history and development of our congregations, and nothing can show more plainly their uniqueness and individuality. Almost every one of our congregations came from humble beginnings. 
the stories of their journeys to where they are today can all be found in the archives. Though the archives is not large enough to keep all parish records, I do ask the congregations send me duplicates of their most important legal documents, such as articles of incorporation and bylaws, property documents, such as deeds, and architectural drawings, and endowment and other important financial documents. Parochial reports and parish and mission audits are also kept in the archives. And as mentioned before, if a church should close, the archives takes custody of their records. Pictured here, we have uh, St. Peter's in Seattle, St. Luke's in Tacoma, and Church of the Holy Apostles in Bellevue. The archives collection of architectural drawings is quite extensive and will soon be digitized for easier access. The collection includes drawings for most of the congregations, the camps and conference centers, diocesan house, and other properties. Active clergy records are kept in the bishop's office. However, once a clergy person retires, leaves the diocese, or passes away, the file comes to the archives. These are confidential records. However, I do also maintain a reference file on clergy that contains publicly available information. As you can see, the archives also maintains a large clergy photo collection. Pictures here are Peter Edward Highland, Dean Richard Watson at the cathedral, George Ziegler, who is in Auburn. Uh, the picture is him uh, painting the church in Auburn, actually. Uh, Glyon Benson, getting off the Royal Cross. Joseph Kitagawa, Connie Moorhead and William Dengdeng, Ruben Nevius and Thomas Jessup, Joan Anthony, and then there's a clergy gallery, uh, gathering down in the corner. We have an extensive photo collection of clergy. The archives is also home to an interesting collection of artifacts and memorabilia. There are lots of fun things to look at and in some cases to reminisce about. A few of the things pictured here include the diocesan seal, the Bishop Keeter Cup for Good Citizenship, dated 1916, the Bishop Keeter, oh, the Bishop Keeter Cup, yes, a pennant from Camp Houston, and a St. Mark's Cathedral Medal for Sunday School attendance. The archives is also home to a fairly large collection of books, most of which were either written or owned by bishops and other clergy in the diocese. And now we're back where we started. I'd like to thank you for visiting us. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the diocesan archives. Or if you have questions about either starting uh, a parish archives or working with what you may already have. Um, also, when it's once again possible uh, to do so, I'm always happy to visit congregations and help in any way I can. So now, if there are any questions that you'd like me to answer, um, this would be the time. So if there are any questions in the chat, I will take them now. So thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in the archives. Thank you, Diane. I'm going to open it up now to Q&A. Uh, there's a couple of questions coming in, Diane. One okay. is, can materials be taken out of the archives? Not usually. <laughs> uh, it's very seldom that it would be under very special circumstances. Um, most of the materials in the, in the archives are one of a kind. Uh, if there are duplicates, uh, taking something out might be a possibility. Um, or if it's for uh, a special exhibition or a display, um, you'd have to talk to me about it. There are occasional what about, uh, what about, uh, what about copies? Oh yeah, we can make copies. Again, there are some things that uh, either are too fragile or might be confidential and couldn't be copied, but otherwise I'm happy to make copies. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, let's see, I was, I'm just adding to this because it's a, I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah. The, the next one is you mentioned digitizing. How do you go about that? Well, I don't do it personally. Um, a few things I do myself, but most of the materials uh, have to be prepared first, which basically means that any kind of fasteners or anything like that has to be taken out. 
Uh, they have to all be put in the order that you want them to be when they're digitized. And then there's a company uh, that's actually located in Issaquah that does most of the digitization for me. I've been working with them for several years and uh, they'll be the ones that will be doing the architectural drawings as soon as I can get back into the office and start getting those ready. You shared with me once, Diane, that, um, that you know, the time we live in, I guess I could ask it this way. How many different formats have you gone through uh, in the way of digitizing? Like, uh, you know, the rave was what? Uh, microfilm at one point and then it was uh, digital. How many of those have you been through? And what's the well, latest iteration? Yeah, well, we still actually have all of those. But yes, the problem has been things have changed so fast. Um, microfilm, um, tapes of various kinds, audio tapes, cassette tapes, VHS tapes. Um, then you have all the, the DVDs at one time, optical discs, although we didn't have any of those that I know of, um, but I know other organizations that had those. Um, and then now CDs and DVDs, and they're sort of starting on their way out. So yes, it's changed a lot. And the problem with all of these things is that many of them, we don't really know how long, uh, they'll actually last, like a videotape or a DVD or a CD, how long the physical medium will last. And then the other problem uh, is managing to keep the uh, hardware that you need to play these things on. Any kind of digital or electronic medium, you have to have something, a piece of hardware that uh, you can use so you can uh, open these files. And even now, um, remember the, the small, uh, or the large, I should say, uh, the large floppy disks, how many computers can open those? So um, I do try to keep some of those uh, types of equipment in the archives. So when we get some of that, we can at least try to open them and see what's there. But things move so quickly and that's been a, it's been a big problem as far as keeping um, materials and being able to access them over time. Yeah, it's hard to keep up with. That's a, <clears throat> so we have a kind of combined question here. <clears throat> How do we find out if you have our most recent parishioner reports and bylaws, or better phrased, who gives you the updated parishioner reports and bylaws, the church uh, office or church archivist? Well, that's a good question. Uh, if they come to the diocese, wh whoever gets them. Uh, right now we have a fairly uh, a file that we're keeping uh, in just in the workroom where, where things that come in uh, are being filed and then they eventually move on. And so uh, I check that um, on a fairly regular basis to see if there's anything there that needs to come to the archives. Um, usually uh, some of the like, um, um, your, uh, your administrative assistant. Uh, if she knows that it's something that's permanent, she will pass it on to me. Uh, and other people will do the same. Sometimes I have to ask, but there are certain things that sort of come to me on a regular, regular basis. And there are certain yes. things that the congregations are supposed to be sending in. And um, again, sometimes they need to be reminded that this, these uh, records need to come to the diocese. They come to me so, all the <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, the staff knows pretty much uh, what needs to go to Diane. So when we get things, we'll send it in. Now, uh, I was going to tell you a couple things uh, about how Diane's helpful to us in every day. Uh, one is uh, if if I go on a visitation, there's a form that's filled out about everybody that was confirmed or received. And that form is, we ask that they send that back to the church. We actually follow up uh, to the diocesan office. And if they don't send it back, we're usually hounding them because she keeps that form. And also our office uses that for address updates uh, on our newsletters and things like that. Uh, some of you have uh, witnessed after a cleric dies in our a diocese, I usually try to send out a bio and I get rave reviews about those because they're so thorough and even the families often tell me how um, what I've sent out is more than they knew. Sometimes they find out things they never knew. 
<laughs> and <clears throat> I'd like to take full credit for that, but I can't because Diane does those. She really puts all of that together. And then I put personal sentiments in there, especially if I knew the person, but uh, she pulls all of that together and it really is a great gift to the diocese and it's a great gift uh, to the families. And sometimes when, uh, especially if it's a priest that hasn't been active for a while, it kind of reintroduces them to the diocese uh, and tells about our history. And I just think it's very, very important. So that's uh, another way. And I would just tell you, it was a few years before I realized I sh should probably be giving more to Diane. So uh, often when I get uh, letters and cards from people thanking me or um, writing something about the diocese, I put those in her box so she can keep them in the archive. So, uh, because one of the great things I love, uh, I don't know if anybody will ever look back at anything I write, but uh, one of the great things I love is looking back at some of the bishops before me and thing topics that they've written on and I've used that often in convention addresses and things like that. Uh, just an accolade. That was great, Diane. How do you do all you do with just one staff member? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> uh, and then uh, in light of what you just said, do we need to try and keep more paper records? Well, for some things, uh, actually paper is better and of the different formats you mentioned uh even though it might seem old-fashioned uh microfilm uh is is uh really considered to be a preservation format much more so than the electronic ones because you can actually read and see a microfilm if you don't have a machine to read it on it is possible to still read it um i would mention we were talking about uh having the materials come to the archives. We also, that's the records management piece. We also have records retention schedule that basically outlines which records are permanent. And uh, if we follow the schedule, the materials that need to come to the archives will get there. So uh, there are a number of, of different um, aspects to this job and uh, I've enjoyed them all for many years. It's great. Uh, let's see. Are any of your digitized photographs available online? They are, and there'll be even more. Um, I think right now, when I've been home and trying to find things I could do that I could do from home rather than actually being in the office, uh, one of the things I've been working about on is a, a photo gallery for the Diocesan um, Archives webpage. And I'm not finished with it. But there are photos there. I've started with uh, a, a, a photo gallery for the bishops and then one for all our congregations. And like I said, they're not complete, but what I have uh, done so far is available. If you go to the archives webpage, go to collections and uh, go under collections, you will find them. And uh, I'd love for people to look at them and give me any feedback about them that you would, uh, that they would care to, care to pass on. So, uh, Diane, I thought you might share two stories because uh, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, one is about the newspaper that was found in the gutter when they were redoing uh, D House. Uh, I may be putting you on the spot, but as I remember, it was like a 1905 paper or 1904 or something like that that we think the rats probably took up there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, there are lots of stories and lots of stories about the house. I do remember hearing something about that, but I don't think there was much left of that particular paper. So I don't think it was uh, of, much, of much value. But yeah, we do have things going, uh, going back. And um, as you said, Diocesan House is an amazing place. Um, I'm looking forward to um, doing that presentation. Um, I talked about it a little bit today, but we'll go into more, uh, more depth, more of the history of the house and how uh, it ended up uh, with us. So uh, I look forward to that. And there are a lot of really fascinating things in the archives. Um, uh, odd things, yes, and then uh, many more uh, valuable things as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would say too that Diane's in charge of 
uh, what's sometimes affectionately known in the council room is the rogues gallery, which is all the po <laughs> photographs and of the bishops or portraits. Uh, we've moved away from portraits because they're so expensive and, and so hard to do really these days, but and moved to photographs. She's responsible for that. And uh, I know when I got there, I wondered why they were not, were not in order but uh, she helped get them in order. They're in order now from one to eight uh, or seven, seven and a half, I guess with uh, Nettie there. Yeah. She's hardly a half, but she's up there too, which is good. And uh, the interesting thing is we couldn't find the original portrait of Bishop Keeter. And uh, so I walked into Annie Wright one day and looked up above their fireplace and there it was. So uh, she and I working together, uh, tried to figure out how we were going to do it. And Bishop Keeter, um, Annie Wright loved that uh, photo so much that we kind of had a church-wide crisis because they refused to give it back to us, even though that's the original. So we asked them if we could get a copy, which they let us do. And Diane's the one that took care of that. That's, that's an example of some of the things she does every day that um, help us. So she got a really nice copy and nobody can tell it's I can't tell that it's not the actual portrait and uh it's up in uh, D house but it's not the original the original hand hangs in Annie Wright still because they love it and wanted to keep it so a couple well, more questions very, have come in oh, yeah just, go ahead I was just gonna say Bishop Keeter was very involved with Annie Wright and yeah. he actually lived uh, very close to Annie Wright, and I think uh, actually may have even lived uh, on the campus there for a while. So he was very closely associated with, with the school, and uh, I'm sure that's why his, his portrait was there. But it was very nice to get to have his um, portrait, a copy made, and so that sort of completed our collection uh, in the council room. Yeah, they showed me actually a little apartment that used to be, he used to stay in right above the big main hall. So he actually lived there for a while is, is what I understand too. Uh, so this is a great question. I heard the Tiffany window at the Burke Museum originally came from Diocesan House. Is this true? This yes, is a good is. story. It is absolutely true. Uh, when the house was built for the Learys, there were two amazing uh, Tiffany windows installed in the Great Hall. Um, the very tall, um, majestic peacock window is on one side of the fireplace, and then uh, a smaller uh, landscape scene was on the other side. Um, those windows were in the house when the diocese purchased the house in 1980. They were taken out uh, like 1957, 58, somewhere around in there. Uh, I don't have the full story about why they were taken out, but it seems that there were people who thought it made the room too dark and uh, possibly uh, that they weren't in keeping with um, a building that was being used for uh, a religious organization. I don't know. That, it's all sort of uh, hearsay. But in any case, they were taken out. Is it there? Wasn't there a story that Bishop that Bishop Bain uh, said that made it seem like a funeral parlor or a mausoleum or something? Well, actually, Doctor <laughs> Doctor Ho Hodges said that, but he said it to oh, Bishop okay. Bain, who probably agreed with him because, in any event, the windows were taken out. Yes. And uh, they were given to the University of Washington. Um, the idea was that they were supposed to go into uh, a women's uh, residence hall, which was going to be built and named after Mrs. Leary. Well, that never happened. So the windows were actually forgotten for many years before somebody found them. And then they, uh, they hung them uh, in the Burke Museum and they were there for quite a while. And then the Burke sort of changed uh, no, its collection uh, philosophy, things they were doing. So they took the windows down. And, but now uh, they have a brand new beautiful facility. And through the efforts of a core group of people, uh, people who wanted to see these windows on display again, um, they raised uh, a lot of money to have the windows restored. They sent them to New York. And uh, the windows, the peacock window is like seven layers of glass. They're just amazing. 
Uh, and so they had to be taken apart. They had to be cleaned and put all back together again. And now they're back at the Burke and on display and they're absolutely gorgeous. But I wish, still wish we had them in the house. I do too. I and do. Uh, you know, I've, uh, some Tiffany experts rate the peacock window in the top five ever done, which is pretty amazing, I think. So, it was. It, uh, it was. No, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it was a Tiffany studio piece. It was one that uh, he had on uh, exhibit before it was installed in the house for the Learys. Wonderful. Uh, Let's see, uh, another question. Can you send us a list of documents you need to have sent to you? I think you once told me most items need to stay in each parish's own archives, right. but what are the ones you do would like to have in the archives? At okay, the office yeah, station? it's, I obviously cannot keep everybody's uh, records, but there are certain things I would like to have. Um, we certainly want any kind, uh, we'd want articles of incorporation, bylaws. Um, we want any kind of important financial documentation like endowment records, um, architectural drawings. And I don't necessarily need to have the originals, but it would be nice to have a copy. Um, and anything else along those, uh, those lines, the uh, important legal and financial documents that you might have, property deeds, for instance. Um, it's really just a backup for the congregations for us to have that. Um, because sometimes um, there, uh, there have been fires in the past. Um, other problems, sometimes they just go missing, they just disappear, or they get lost, or there might be water damage, or you just don't know what's going to happen. So basically, I just want those things as a backup, the most important uh, financial and property uh, records that you might have, and also the uh, or organizational documents like the Articles of Incorporation and so forth. Yeah, just recently, we had a case where one of our churches uh, leases out its space and the people were being kind of uh, uh, belligerent about following our guidelines and so we needed to find the lease agreement with them and we couldn't find it uh, we did finally find it but uh, it would that's one of the places I went I went straight to Diane and said do you have this uh, and now she does because we found it and now now they're gonna have a copy there because yeah. we learned our lesson about having a copy. So those definitely, maybe one reason to, uh, or way to ask this, Diane, is what what's the one, the, the most uh, regrettable thing you say the most often, I wish people would send me this. Is there any one of those things, like I wish I had more of this that yeah. people would do? Yeah. Well, one of the things that people ask me for most frequently uh, are records having to do with endowments uh, or uh, bequests, financial considerations, because it can yeah. be so yeah. important to a congregation. And I do have a story uh, of a congregation uh, that needed money. They needed money for a roof and uh, they didn't think they had any. They did have an endowment. They knew they did, but they thought that the terms were such that they could only take the, um, you know, the interest, which is the case most of the time. But um, we found the original. Fortunately, it was in the archives. And the way it was stated is that that was the case. They could only have the interest, but for 50 years. After that, they could do whatever they wanted with the money. And this thing was like 75 years old or something. So, you know, they had the money there, but they didn't know it. And they would never have known it if we hadn't actually had the documentation. So those kinds of things that are really so important. So I would say copies of property deeds and uh, important financial information like that. Uh, and again, I, I don't need the originals. Uh, copies are fine, but um, just something so that if it's misplaced or it can't be found, um, we have a way of locating that information. Uh, okay, great. A uh, couple other questions. Do you have any guidelines on storing beautiful old vestments? 
Well, there are uh, different ways to store textiles. Um, there are a lot of sources of information out there. Uh, I can help you with that. The Diocesan Altar Guild is also a very good resource for uh, things along those lines. Uh, very simply, there's uh, acid-free tissue, there's acid-free boxes. Uh, there are different ways of um, you know, uh, preserve, preserving these kinds of materials. So yes, I can help with that. Uh, and or the Altar Guild would also be uh, another source. Yeah, the Altar yeah. Guild could help a lot with that too, I think. Uh, another question, how should we keep old emails that document important business? I know this one you and I talk about a lot. So. Yeah, well, uh, there are a couple ways to do it. Um, the old fashioned way would be to print them out. And the only time I would do that is if it's something that's really, really important and you don't want to take any chance on losing. Um, otherwise, there are uh, electronic ways to keep those things. We have a digital um, um, archives that we've set up. Um, you, can, uh, you can transfer them to other types of, of uh, uh, electronic storage media. Um, there's different ways to do it. So I would say to just contact me directly about that because it's not a, a simple thing to do necessarily. But you're right in that emails, you have to treat them just like any other kind of correspondence. And um, just because they're in electronic format, um, it doesn't mean that there aren't things there that you have to keep. But on the other hand, you obviously don't have to keep everything. So uh, get in touch with me about that if you want to know more. It's a very good question and a very difficult one for a lot of us about what exactly to do. Uh, question, is there any archiving work that we could use volunteers for, that you oh, could uh, use uh, volunteers for? Yeah, I often have volunteers, and I know a number of <clears throat> congregations who have worked with their um, archival materials who have volunteers. What I would say is if there are people interested in doing that, I'd be happy to meet with you uh, when <laughs> that's possible, or I'd be happy to talk with you on the phone. But yes, absolutely, there are a lot of things that, that people can do. Um, that uh, there's a certain amount of expertise um, that would be helpful, but there are also a lot of things you can do. There are a lot of basics that you can do without a lot, uh, a lot of, of training or education in the field. So yes, absolutely. Call me about it. Right. Right. So Diane, you, you said, uh, you may have uh, touched on this before, before we wrap up uh, just one more time. If somebody needs you to check on something, what's the best way to contact you? Right now, or yeah. any time. Right now. Well, uh, uh, right now and any time. Yeah. Okay. Well, right now, probably by email is the best thing. Um, I am going into the office on a limited um, basis. I try to go in once a week for a few hours. Um, we'll see how how things go. Um, I am also able to access uh, a fair amount of information online. So it just depends on. What you're looking for, so you can uh, you can call me. Um, I know our our um, calls are being forward. I've gotten a couple of that way, but I think email is really the best way right now to to reach me. Great. Well, uh, we've run through our questions. I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, the final one was very interesting and fun webinar today. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. you are truly a gem of the diocese, and I agree with that totally. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. We did record this. So if you watched it and you thought, wow, there are other people who need to see this, uh, it will be up probably in a couple days. And uh, we have a video page now where we're collecting our webinars that we've done, and this will be on there. So uh, you will be able to um, find this at some point. Uh, lots of thank yous coming in, Diane. I don't know if you can thank see you. those, but I thank you too. Thank you, Carrie, for being in the background and helping us as always. And uh, blessings to everyone as we depart. Thank you so much.